she's probably going, you're a thing, I'm going to work with you, you're a piece of me. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I want to call to order the Amberley Village Council meeting of June 11, 2018. Please call the roll. Rich Bardock? Here. Peg Conway? Here. Ed Hattenbach? Here. Alita Kamine? Here. Tom Eating? Here. Ray Warren? Here. Natalie Wolf? Here. Scott Larmer? Here. Kevin Frank? Here. Deke Wallace? Here. Rick Peck? Here. And if everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, the indivisible, First item on the agenda this evening is the approval of our minutes from our last meeting. Uh, those were circulated to all council members in the package, and there were a couple editorial changes that were circulated again today. Are there any other changes, deletions to those minutes? If not, we'll <coughs> the minutes approved. We'll now move on to the finance report for April 2018. Thank you, Mayor. Included in your council packet are the, is a summary of the UAM report. It was also in your packet. Just to review briefly, the earnings tax for the month of April totaled $680,000. That is down 0.9% from April of 2017's uh, collection of $687,000. That brings our total to, year, to the year to date is uh, $1.1 million. Our estimate for the year is $2.7 million. The village did receive a um, property tax advance through the, uh, through the county, but this is actually for, um, from the state of Ohio with the first part of the rollback. So the village received in April an amount of $87,259 in addition to $79,000 from uh, in regards to the uh, to rollback. Actually, I shouldn't say it's an advance. It was the remaining portion of our property tax that, um, that we were owed. The village also collected $3,800 in local government fund our estimate for that for the year is a little, little less than $59,000. That brings our total revenue for year to date at um, $2.1 million. And that represents about 44% has been collected as of uh, the end of April. The expenses for the month of April for the general fund total $351,000. Our total expenditures year to date, $1.5 million. We have a $5.1 million budget, so we've spent about 30% of the uh, 2018 budget. And that leaves us with an unencumbered general fund balance at the end of April of $5.6 million. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions for the man? If not, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, and we invite Richard Kelly, our state representative, to give, give her up. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for giving me just a few brief minutes to talk a little bit about what's happening in Columbus. My name is Bridget Kelly. I am the state representative uh, for the 31st district, of which uh, almost all of Amberley, minus maybe half a block, is a part. Um, I'm in my first term in the House of Representatives, uh, so we're also in State Senator Cecil Thomas's district. Uh, so just wanted to remind people, if you have any issues, please feel free to contact our office. My legislative aide is Hope Lane. She is absolutely wonderful, very responsive. Our email address is rep31 at ohiohouse.gov. That is rep31 at ohiohouse.gov. Uh, the House is actually back in session. Uh, we recently had a, about a 55-day hiatus. Uh, our Speaker resigned uh, due to an FBI probe, and then the majority party had a little bit of uh, a challenge in electing a new leader, so happy to report we're back at work. We passed uh, 28 bills this week alone, uh, and we've been scheduled for two additional session days, one on June 20th and one on June 27th, and then we expect to be in recess for the summer, as is customary. Uh, but we will be continuing to work in the district, much as we did uh, over the past 55 days and over the uh, past uh, year and a half or so of our term. Uh, we hold regular office hours called State House in Your Neighborhood, uh, usually once a month. So our next one is scheduled for July 2nd from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Madisonville Branch Library. So again, July 2nd, 5.30 to 7.30 at the Madisonville Branch Library. We don't really have a set agenda. Uh, you, people can stop by as they're able 
people, sometimes people like to stay five minutes, other times people like to stay the whole time and hear all of the really interesting things that we're talking about and that are important to the people who live in our district. Um, I do come with some good news. We had our uh, first bill that has passed out of the House and the Senate, uh, which is House Bill 347, which would name a part of I-71 after Officer Sonny Kim. And so that is just waiting to be signed by the governor, which we certainly hope that he will do expeditiously. Uh, in addition, I just wanted to give you a quick update on a few pieces of legislation that we've been working on and a few that might be of interest uh, to you all and to the citizens of Amberley. Uh, so in terms of bills that we've been working on, uh, we have House Bill 61, which would exempt feminine hygiene products from the sales tax and make those more accessible to women in our state. House Bill 278, which would strengthen the move over law and keep our law enforcement officers uh, safer in the state. House Bill 432, which would license student loan servicers and create an ombudsman in the Department of Commerce just so our college students know the true cost of borrowing and can figure out exactly who they need to pay back and when they need to pay back and be a little bit more familiar with those terms. Uh, House Bill 542, which would provide pay stubs to employees. So Ohio is one of only a handful of states that does not require employers to provide employees with pay stubs. Uh, so this is a bipartisan bill that we've been working on uh, that's currently in committee. House Bill 576 to increase Ohio's minimum wage to $15 by 2025, and then House Bill 660, which would require the state to release a report of the employees, the employers who have the highest number of employees that get public assistance, because we think that's a, a good move for transparency and good governance. Uh, other bills to watch, House Bill 160, which I know you're all familiar with because you've certainly been uh, on the front lines in supporting this, the Ohio Fairness Act, which would make it illegal to discriminate against um, people in our state based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, that's in a committee on which I serve on government accountability and oversight, and so I'm really hoping that that will uh, continue to move. I think that's an important piece of legislation for our state. There have been a number of anti-worker bills and resolutions introduced, uh, including right to work. Uh, we have a stand your ground bill, House Bill 228. Um, that has been moving through committee that would um, change the burden of proof in self-defense cases. House Bill 512, which would change the education administration in our state and take it from you know, the Department of Higher Education and move it to one cabinet level position that would be appointed by the governor. Um, we also have a number of bills that would make changes to health care that's available in our state. And then we recently passed House Bill 123, which provides a few more guardrails for payday loans to protect consumers in our state. So we just wanted to come and give an update about some of the things that we've been working on. Again, my name is Bridget Kelly. Our email is rep31 at ohiohouse.gov. Are there any questions? Um, yeah, I have a couple questions about a couple of the bills. The first one that you mentioned, I don't remember the number, but it was uh, regarding uh, re removing state sales tax from feminine hygiene products, mm -hmm. and I was wondering whether that bill had bipartisan support. Uh, thank you very much for the question and to the mayor and the vice mayor. That is House Bill 61. It is a bipartisan bill. Um, we've so far had sponsor testimony as well as proponent testimony, and we're hoping that uh, we might get another hearing or even a vote in the Ways and Means Committee. Great. And the, and the other is uh, the stand your ground. Can you go into a little more detail about that um, when you say change the burden of proof? Right now is the burden on the um, person who claims self-defense or so I will. Will the burden be on someone to say it wasn't self-defense? I mean, what? Yes, I will do, and to the mayor and to the vice mayor, I will do my best job, but I'd be happy to follow up with you more on this. I will say I have not been a party to the testimony. This was in the Committee on um, Federalism, which is not a committee in which I serve, and actually there are only two attorneys on that committee, and as far as I understand it, that has um, been a pretty significant problem because you're looking at changing a pretty substantive part of the law, and the people on that committee, while they have a lot of great expertise in different areas, they don't necessarily have law degrees. Um, and so as far as I understand, it would put the burden of proof on the, the, the offender in this particular case. So if, if, you, if you break into my house and I decide that I want to protect myself against you, then the burden would then be on you instead of on me. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't want to go into too much 
detail and quiz you on every aspect, but, but I, from my understanding with Spaniel ground laws, they come into play regardless of whether um, the person who is shot um, was even doing anything wrong. Uh, to the mayor and to the vice mayor, that is my understanding as well. Could you just repeat the, um, the bill number on the one concerning pay stubs? Um, yes, uh, and to the mayor and to council member Conway, that bill is House Bill 542. And does that have bipartisan support? That also has bipartisan support. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, and you, you are always welcome um, to come any time to our council meetings. And it was, and it was great hearing all that uh, is, is underway. I appreciate that. And if I may, Mayor, with, when I'm providing the documents as follow-up, should I send those through your office or through the Vice Mayor's office? Do you have a preference? Through the village office to our clerk. Okay. We'll be happy to do that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you. Uh, we had another citizen on the agenda to speak, but she apparently is not here this evening. So we will move on to committee reports and we'll start with the finance. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the first item I have on the uh, agenda here is to address a depository agreement pursuant to Resolution 2018-11. The purpose of this resolution is to comply with, sta with the state law requiring local governments to establish public depositories for all public funds. As required by the state of Ohio, every five years, the village must designate a public depository for the village funds for the next five years. The village declares one financial institution to be the public depository for the village active funds, and potentially more than one institution for interim and in, inactive funds, parenthetically investments. Requests for proposals were sent out to six area banks, and responses were received from Fifth Third, PNC, Huntington Bank, and First Financial Bank. The RFPs were reviewed by the finance administrator and all four banks that responded gave, provide excellent professional services and assistance. Uh, Fifth Third offered the highest earnings credit of 0.65%. Uh, Fifth Third fees and additional costs were substantially higher than the other banks. First financial fees were certainly more than PNC and Huntington, and their banking locations were not as convenient as our PNC and Huntington. While Huntington's fees were competitive, PNC offered a treasury enterprise package with which many standard fees are not charged, making the fees substantially lower. Based upon these factors, it is recommended to council declare PNC as the public funds depository for active funds. Accordingly, I move that we adopt resolution number 2018-11, resolution for approving and adopting certificate for the treasury management services and designating depositories. Second. Excuse me. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve resolution 2018-11, approving and adopting the certificate for treasury management services and designating depositories. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-11. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Be it noted that the resolution passed unanimously. My other item is the 2019 tax budget. Uh, this, the purpose of this is to justify local government needs for 2019. Each year, the state of Ohio requires <coughs> local governments to adopt a budget to justify receipt of local government funds from the state by July 15, submit to, submitted to the county auditor by July 20. The tax budget must demonstrate the village's need for funding of next year's services. According to the public hearing is required. Uh, and again, we explain this every time, every year on tax budget. Our, our true budget cycle is more in the October, November time frame. We have a, a calendar year budget. Uh, this is a requirement uh, of the state uh, that we submit this tax budget. And as part of this process, we do hold a public hearing which related to the tax process. So I hereby would like to open the public hearing and offer the opportunity for anyone who would like to testify before this public hearing to do so. 
and the public hearing is opened at 6.50. <laughs> Seeing that there apparently is no one interested in testifying, I hereby close the public hearing and state that the public hearing closed at 6.50. <laughs> To the <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in October, Village Council will be asked to accept the rates of taxation as established by the Budget Commission, which will finalize the tax budget process. All of these, all of this will transition into the preparation, preparation of the 2019 operating budget, which will be reviewed by the Finance Committee and approved by the Village Council in December. Accordingly, I introduce resolution number 2018-12 resolution approving a budget of estimated available funds est estimated required expenditures for general and non-general funds for the calendar year 2019 and authorizing the village manager to submit the tentative budget to the county auditor with recommendations for the continuation of the present tax. So, second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-12. Uh, are there any questions or comments? Not, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-12. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be noted that the resolution passes unanimous. That concludes my report. Thank you. We'll now move on to the police and fire committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, the committee met on May 31st and dealt with a number of items, the first of which is a resolution concerning uh, replacement of the mobile data computers which are in the cruisers with new and updated equipment. Um, our police along with law enforcement personnel in the whole county rely on these MDCs for uh, quick and efficient access to information in a mobile environment. The current MDCs are at the end of their life and out of warranty and need to be replaced. Uh, the Hamilton County Commissioners provide some funding via the countywide computerized police information center, the clear levy. Uh, the money from this 1982 levy assists with the cost of replacing the MDC computers in all Amberley Police Cruisers. Amberley Village will have a total of seven new MDC computers and mounting docks with this lease agreement. The total cost for the purchase of the seven MDCs and docks is $17,137.50. Uh, the funds for purchasing the MDCs has been budgeted for two years, awaiting the county uh, plan for everyone. And the funding for this purchase would come from the village's capital fund. Uh, this lease agreement and equipment upgrade is necessary in order to be part of the countywide criminal information system. The village's costs and a five year lease agreement with the county for the equipment has been reviewed by the police fire committee and recommended. So, therefore, I move that we adopt resolution number 2018 13, authorizing the village manager to enter into a contract to lease mobile data computers and equipment to connect to clear system for the police department. So moved. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt the resolution 2018-13, uh, which would provide new mobile data computers for our police. Uh, are there any questions or comments? If not, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-13. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be noted that the resolution passed. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Also, at our committee meeting, you may recall at our last council meeting, we had a resident address us about uh, concerns about speeding on Ridge Road, uh, and that was referred to our committee for that discussion. Uh, we were, had a report from staff regarding the, the speed being set by the Ohio Revised Code based on the characteristics of the road. They had sought information from the village engineer. Uh, there were four residents, uh, both from the north and south area of the village, who spoke, in addition to concerns about speed, uh, several, two of them expressed concern about the ability to cross the street on bridge, because they are walkers, and also some broader safety concerns of a general nature, regard, basically regarding driver inattention. Um, we were also, it was reported by the chief that it is possible, it may be possible to request a change in speed limit if we felt that that would be helpful. Um, but we are awaiting further information from the engineer on whether, in fact, what that process might be. So we didn't take any action. We we're just going to keep, you know, await further information and continue to, you know, it just kind of, I see it, it just adds to 
our awareness that people are concerned about road safety in the village. And finally, the third item uh, is that the, uh, the chief may say more about this, but we were informed that the bike safety fair is going to be held again this year on June 24th at the JCC from 9 a.m. So that concludes my report. Are there any questions? Please. Okay, we will now move on to the streets, public utilities, and sewers. Thank you. Um, Last month, I didn't have an opportunity to go through all the items that the committee covered at our May 3rd meeting, so um, I'll use this opportunity to, uh, to discuss two items. Uh, one has to do with a traffic study update, and the second, which information is be before you, has to do with natural gas aggregation. Um, <clears throat> the first item is, has to do with the traffic study update. The traffic study was initiated um, over the last year at the intersection of Section Road and Fair Oaks Drive. In order to determine if a four-way stop upgrade was needed from the current three-way stop. This was prompted by residents who expressed that the intersection wasn't safe for pedestrians nor vehicular traffic. The analysis and report from CT consultants found that the peak hour traffic, that is at AM and PM, and reported accidents since 2012 didn't warrant a four-way conversion. Uh, during discussions, uh, Mr. Lama reported that installing a crosswalk at, that, at the intersection might actually not be a good idea, but, uh, but provide a full sense of security uh, to the pedestrians. Obviously, we um, were hoping to develop the um, Port Authority property on Section Road, and assuming that comes to pass in the near future, uh, TIF funds could be available that would provide the best solution for the pedestrians. For example, a, um, a section road upgrade coupled with a pedestrian path from the railroad tracks all the way to Ridge Road. So um, the last thing that uh, CT recommended, which we have done in the past, is that to improve the visibility, um, we consider trimming the tree canopy that, that could obstruct the view of the southbound traffic on Fair Oaks looking out to the west. And I believe we did that a few years back. So. That's something that we might want to um, revisit um, again. Um, second item on the agenda uh, is uh, natural gas aggregation. Um, as you know, the Amberley Village has been aggregating utilities for residents since November 2000, 2011, when voters approved electric and natural gas aggregation. Electric aggregation has been more prominent and worthwhile, but the village has also realized success on gas aggregation as well. Overall, village residents have saved over a million dollars with electric and gas aggregation since 2011. And the village has a strong history of aggregation that has been uh, very worthwhile. Our current gas aggregation program was awarded in 2016 after Don Marshall of Eagle Energy, the village's energy consultant, sent requests for proposals or RFPs to seven potential gas suppliers. <clears> Three <throat> responses were received and uh, Eagle recommended an agreement with IGS since they offer the lowest variable price. This arrangement enabled the village to lock in pricing if the market warranted such action. However, it didn't, and the village remains on a variable gas rate. The current contract with IGS Energy ends with the October 2018 billing. Our purchases have been month to month since October 2016, and our purchase rates have been lower than Duke every month. Due to the expiring contract, 50% of requirements through August have been hedged. Purchase opportunities beyond August will not be permitted without a new contract with IGS. IGS will not purchase anything beyond October at this time since there is not a contract in place after October. So the issue becomes one of pricing and if the village believes a purchase should be made, it won't be able to execute a purchase order beyond October. While there's, been relatively, <clears throat> excuse me, while there's been relatively good fixed natural gas prices recently, Don Marshall requested IGS to provide some current prices, and they responded with a fixed rate option and variable rate components. The fixed rate option for one year would be about 42 cents per cubic, per 100 cubic feet, and a two-year option would be about 43 cents per 100 cubic feet. Eagle Energy reviewed the future natural gas market and believes continuing on the current path of securing gas on a month-to-month -month basis is our best option. One-year delivered prices would be in the order of 40 to 41 cents per 100 cubic feet, 
and a two-year option would be a similar rate, about 40 to 42 cents per 100 cubic feet. The contract does allow for prices to be locked in at any time during the contract term, which is what we've had over the last two years. Eagle Energy has recommended that we renew IGS and not issue a new request for proposals uh, to evaluate additional suppliers. If the village continues to purchase on a month-to-month -month basis, there's not much to be gained by an RFP since natural gas is purchased by the New York uh, Mercantile Exchange by most suppliers in this region. Since the village is satisfied with the performance, has, has been satisfied with the performance of IGS and its current performance, the Streets Public Utilities Committee recommended continuing with IGS on a month-to-month -month basis with the ability to lock in if necessary. Their aggregation, their, excuse me, their, our recommendation is to improve, is to approve Ordinance 2018-9, authorizing a contract for natural gas aggregation for a 24-month period. Now, typically for ordinances, we require a three-month rating. Since we're really kind of under the gun to have this done quickly, um, I'm going to request that we waive the three readings of this ordinance and put it into effect immediately so that the village can enter, into con can enter into a contract with IGS as soon as possible. This will enable the village to secure the best rate due to the variability in the natural gas market, and then the village can proceed with the aggregation program passed by the residents. So the first motion would be to waive the three readings of, of Ordinance 2018-9 um, as an emergency measure <clears throat> in order to meet our, uh, our October deadline um, for securing a new rate for gas. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we waive the three readings on Ordinance 2018-9, uh, which related to the uh, procurement of natural gas for our aggregation contract. Are there any questions or comments related to the waiver? Okay, if not, it has been moved and seconded that we waive the three readings on Ordinance 2018-9. Please call the roll. Rich Barda? Yes. Mike Conway? Yes. Ed Hattenbach? Yes. Alita Kamine? Yes. Tom Muthing? Yes. Ray Warren? Yes. Natalie Wood? Yes. Okay, so, uh, the next proposal um, before council is to pass ordinance number 2018-9, authorizing the village manager to execute a second amendment to the master agreement in order to enter into a contract with a natural gas aggregator for a specific time period. And we were referring to this in the two year extension. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt ordinance 2018-9. Uh, please call the roll. Rich Bardock? Yes. Peg Conway? Yes. Ed Hattenbach? Yes. Alita Kamine? Yes. Tom Muthing? Yes. Ray Warren? Yes. Natalie Wolf? Yes. And that concludes the Streets Committee. Yeah. Still need to emergency. make emergency. You need to make a motion to, to pass it as an emergency measure, which would allow it to go into immediate effect. Okay, so, so I propose to um, that this measure be enacted as an emergency measure that will take effect immediately. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt uh, Ordinance 2018-9 as an emergency measure which would allow it to go into an immediate effect given the timing of when we need this. Uh, is there any questions or comments related to that? If not, please call the roll. Rich Bardock? Yes. Peg Conway? Yes. Ed Hattenbach? Yes. Alita Kamine? Yes. Tom Muthing? Yes. Ray Warren? Yes. Natalie Wolf? Yes. And that concludes the Streets Committee report. Okay. Um, so I We're had a about the comment traffic. about the traffic study. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think it's actually really notable that two reports in a row were had pedestrian safety concerns and crossing the street. And I, I have um, confidence that that is, you know, we're, we will continue to be talking about that. I think. The conversation about Gibson is um, is important as a component of that, but I do um, I, I've heard a lot of concerns from the folks who live in that neighborhood about the stop sign issue. I mean, I'm sure it's perennial, and I just want to encourage us and urge us to not just say like, well, the, you know, the engineering traffic study is done, so we can wash our hands of that and send that away. I 
think I just would encourage us to revisit that over time as things change. I think, you know, I'm not an engineer, and I, but I, I know traffic engineers are very conservative about this type of thing and when the studies are done. I think that came up in the committee, like, you know, well, that's maybe not the time. So anyway, I'm just, I, I would just encourage um, the committee to keep the stop sign conversation on the radar screen as we go forward. And obviously, we will be, um, we will be talking about pedestrian issues again. I just think that the folks in that neighborhood are not going to, uh, may, may not find sort of like a satisfactory conclusion by the conclusion from that report necessarily. Um, so I understand where we are right now. Well, I mean, the only, the only, comment, I can, the only comment I can make to that, and, and, and certainly I share your concerns, uh, the only comment I can add to that is that the engineer's report is really reflecting, you know, how do we define safety at that point? Okay, and so safety can be defined by, well, how many accidents have you had? At that point? Okay, well, or how much traffic is going by that point? And based on the studies they did, I mean, the amount of traffic that's been going through that intersection is, relative, is relatively low, even relative to the, relative to the past. Um, now, that doesn't mean that residents should feel necessarily good about it because if residents don't feel safe about the intersection, we need to, you know, we need to address that in some way. But right now, based on the engineer's report, there's, you know, um, um, unless we were to, I guess one possibility is um, unless we felt and residents felt that we really have to have, you know, something done there, and that's something that we I, I just, I, just for the purposes of, you know, I, I want residents to feel like we understand that they're, they're the ones who have to live it every day, and we're, we're listening to them as opposed to just like, well, this, the, I totally understand, but the, you know, the report, the report is a report, and mm -hmm. I understand that there's no action, why we're not taking action right now, and I think it's, the committee was, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the right thing, I'm just um, encouraging us to remind residents that if they're, they can still, you know, share their experiences sure. in all these places. And a good example, actually, something like cutting brush or something is a great example of things that residents should report if that's harming visibility and stuff like that. So I know it's just, it's a, it's a particular intersection I hear a lot about. So um, I think I just want to make sure that we're, we're still listening. Yeah, I, first of all, I want to commend the Streets Committee um, and the um, and Scott and our and for for doing this report because this means that the issue of pedestrian safety has permeated every aspect of mm -hmm. doing business in the village. We've really changed the culture of how we look at um, traffic in the village. It's not just cars; it's bikes and it's people who walk and it's people pushing strollers and you know that's. That's what we should be doing. Um, I think that uh, we should revisit this back in the Health Education and Welfare Committee. And the what, reason I say that is because I recently was invited to speak in a group called, I think it was um, Creating Active Communities. It's, it's like a consortium similar to First Suburbs and all our surrounding communities because they were particularly interested in our pedestrian safety resolution that we passed. So that gave me the opportunity to reread what we said in our resolution. And one of the points uh, was that we were going to come back and revisit pedestrian safety and revisit all of the things that we had been, been doing, like the speed humps and, and all the other little things. And in addition, we were going to um, add a line item for pedestrian safety in the budget for 2017. And I think that we need to just go back and make sure that we're doing all of the things that we said that we were going to be doing proactively for pedestrian safety. So it doesn't, it just, I mean, an engineering study is excellent. And I think it was done in the right committee. Um, you know, it's, it's never a finished issue. I'd also like to add, I mean, just as likely an oversight, recall we did install our first street light at section in Elbrook a few months back, which was also to address uh, vehicular and pedestrian safety. Um, I just want to echo a little bit and, and kind of add, police, that 
Uh, I felt similar to what you described, Alita, when the residents were sitting there, and I really didn't have an answer for them other than kind of what you said is what we said to them. Like, we are listening to this, and we do want to hear these stories because this, we're taking a long view. We aren't going to just, oh, well, we studied it, we're done, and we did you know, we consulted the Ohio Revised Code, and we're done. It's more of a, and the chief reiterated their enforcement efforts around, say, you know, speeding and safety and attention and text and all those things. So it's clearly lots of things. OK. We will now move on to the next. Regarding the aggregation, now that we're off of the uh, um, engineering study, but uh, I, it's never too often to remind our residents that we do this, that we aggregate, because it comes up periodically on Nextdoor that uh, some scam is calling me or some other energy group and who's in on it and who's got the best rate. And I mean, quite honestly, I think that we do the work. We should let them know that maybe they can find a better rate today, but it might not be better soon and then they'll have to pay a penalty to get out of whatever it is but we do the work for our, our residents so that they don't have to and um you know i know it gets reiterated in the newsletter and just i don't think we can it, there can't be too many reminders especially if we're taking action like we are today i i think in usually at least one of the print newsletters every year we have something on this but why don't we plan on the october newsletter definitely have something on aggregation and print. Uh, we'll now move on to compensation and benefits. Okay. The Compensation and Benefits Committee met on May 31st, and the topic was our annual uh, health care and dental renewal, and we have some more good news this year. So just as a reminder, we're part of the Center for Local Government Benefit Pool, um, which is a 16-member consortium to buy health care services for all of the employees of those communities. Um, the health care plan renewal is August 1st. Um, and another quick reminder, the village has two, uh, standardized two high deductible health care plans. And the base plan is a 85-15 um, split. Um, and uh, and the, the platinum, the, the higher level version, the employees can pay a little bit more for a slightly higher coverage. We also um, still contribute to a health savings plan um, for all employees. The premium increase last year for this plan was 3%, and we budgeted 3% this year. Um, our broker, Haran, um, has consistently said that we should expect, uh, based on healthcare inflation trends, 6, 7, 10, 12% increases, and this year they came in with a 2% increase. Um, so that was good news. And um, this is basically uh, because of stability in the plan, a lot of um, really good management and stability. Uh, and also, they reported that the wellness benefit program that they're running has been very successful and actually has um, has led to some decreases in some of the costs as well. So um, as I mentioned, we budgeted 3%. It is um, a 2% increase this year. That breaks down to about a $6,000 impact on the village um, and about $1,000 over all of our employees. So um, not it could be, could be a lot worse. Um, in addition, we also talked about our dental insurance, and that is also good news. We have a uh, flat increase, and it's locked in for two years. So there will be no increases in dental for two years. Um, and then there was also a very, very brief update about um, the uh, life insurance renewal, which we do not have to take action on. So we are, um, I move that we um, pass resolution 2018-14 to renew the health care and dental um, plans and also the contribution to the health savings account for our employees. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-14, which provides for the renew renewal of our health and dental care uh, plans for employees. Are there any questions or comments? If not, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-14. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be it noted that the resolution passed unanimously. And that concludes my report. Okay, we will now move on to the manager. Thank you, Mayor. I had a couple of items I wanted to mention. Uh, Bobby Williams, who was promoted to maintenance worker slash firefighter a few months ago, 
uh, has completed the Ohio firefighter training at Scarlet Oak Academy. So that's good news, but even better news is that he passed his uh, state exam uh, to become a firefighter and uh, he has to put that into practice uh, over the weekend, unfortunately. I uh, wanted to mention a, uh, a couple of grants. The uh, village had applied for a grant through the um, uh, Department of uh, Planning and Development, Hamilton Counties, and this is a, a grant that we sought to assist in the study and the plan of uh, pedestrian as well as vehicular connectivity as it relates to Amberly Green. As we all know, we're talking about the future of that property, and one of the key components of that is how would vehicles access that particular property as well as pedestrians. So we were successful in being named one of the few communities that are going to receive a grant in the amount of $20,000 to further our cause on this particular uh, connectivity plan. So that's great news for us. Um, Chief made me aware last month that we did receive a grant uh, in the amount of $2,900 from the Ohio Department of Commerce, and this is for a fire training grant. As you know, staff has been very uh, assertive in trying to secure grants uh, from various areas. Uh, the chief mentioned a few months ago about the, um, the grant that we were successful in receiving from Firehouse Subs, which uh, equipped uh, one of our police vehicles with uh, a lighting system. And uh, at some point in time, we'll share that with you, uh, show you what that vehicle looks like, because it's, um, it's, it's worthy of it. We took one of our police Tahoes and uh, converted it to a uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's on, the, on the road, but it has the ability to uh, project quite a bit of light on a, on a scene. And then we also received a grant for a thermal imaging camera from Firehouse Cell. So great news uh, for, for on the grant front. The last time I wanted to mention is in regards to the September council meeting. We had rescheduled that meeting at one point in time when we started uh, the year 2018. It's necessary because we have a conflict to reschedule that date. So I'm proposing that um, we reschedule that date to Thursday, September the 6th. So if council is in agreement, a motion is, uh, would be appropriate at this time. I hereby move that we move the uh, council meeting that's currently scheduled for September 13th to September 6th. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we move the September council meeting from the date that we had moved that was scheduled at September 13th to September 6th. Are there any questions or comments? If not, it has been moved, it has been moved and seconded that we move the September council meeting to September 6th. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Be noted that the uh, motion passed its name. All right, thank you. And um, you'll take care of the judge yeah. appointments? Okay. Uh, the last, I don't have any other items for the manager's report, but I do have one. To, I'm sorry, I had the next lien item, so I'm going to go ahead with that. Okay. Uh, as you know, when we uh, enforce property maintenance issues here in the village, there are times when we have to um, uh, take action ourselves, and that was the situation on Aracoma Forest. There was a resident who had vacated their property and had left a significant amount of trash uh, at, the, at, the, at the street. Uh, the resident was not present. Uh, we were not able to get it removed by them. So we uh, contracted for this service. We did provide notice, uh, appropriate notice to the resident and on, on the, uh, primarily on the house. Uh, it's necessary for us to retrieve the, the dollars that we spent. So in total, we spent almost $1,700 paying for a firm to come and remove that debris. That also includes a 15% administrative fee that the village charges. So with uh, resolution 2018-15, it asked the county auditor to place a lien on this particular property so we can recoup the dollars back to the village. So a motion would be in order at this point. I move that with uh, resolution 2018-15 requesting the county auditor to place a lien on the property for usage payment. Second. Okay, we moved and seconded that we adopt <coughs> resolution 2018-15 which would place a lien on property for costs that the village incurred related to nuisance of people. I have a question. So when someone leaves stuff that they're hurt, that's, does that mean it's above and beyond what Rumpy would typically pick up? Or what do we, I mean, what's, what was the nature of 
this was a significant amount of trash. I mean, for $1,700, we, uh, it was a, a lot of trash. And it was obvious that it was uh, becoming an irritant to the neighbors and was blowing around and had sat there for way too long. So this was an extraordinary situation, and that's why we stepped in and took the action. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-15, uh, which would place a lien on the property. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be noted that the resolution passes in. That concludes my report. It's not on the agenda, but Chief, do you have any? Yeah, I just want to talk about the fire we had, kind of give an update on it. Um, I started some pictures around just to kind of give everybody. I did put a few pictures on social media as well as um, um, I think the manager sent some things out to council as well. The, um, when, the alarm, when the alarm came in, it was, it was the whole situation was kind of unique. We had a lightning strike on a house. Uh, the residents were not home. And uh, we actually got an alarm drop from the house next door, the smoke alarm going off. Officers responded with a key. They could smell the smoke. Dispatched the fire department at that point. And then uh, as they checked the house, they could not locate anything. When they went outside, started walking around that property and the next property, that's when they seen the smoke and heavy smoke coming out of the eaves and out of a hole in the roof. Within a matter of minutes, that obviously turned to flames. When it, when, the, when it struck the roof, it, it struck an area of the crawl space. So you'll see in the, in the pictures as they come around where it started on the right side of the house and spread through the entire top of the house. We had interior crews in there attempting to fight the fire, but everything was above the rooms. So if you look at interior pictures of the fire, when the, roofs, when the roof started to collapse, at that point, we went to a defensive attack. Um, and I pulled the personnel out so no one got hurt. But what you'll see is uh, the only fire damage inside the house is a result of the fall down from the roof truss and things like that. It was a, a, a tough situation. It was tough to get to. Um, engine company, fire apparatus alone, we had 14 different fire apparatus there. We had, um, I, kinda, I just want to mention the departments we had there assisting us. We had an engine from Sycamore, engine from Deer Park Silverton, as well as the uh, chief officer. We had an engine from Gulf Manor, engine from Redding, a medic unit from Evendale, an engine from Blue Ash, an uh, engine from Norwood, an, in an engine from Cincinnati, a truck from Cincinnati, a district treat chief from Cincinnati, a heavy rescue from Cincinnati, and a medic from Cincinnati. So with all that, you know, we're looking at having 80 firefighters on the scene of this fire. Um, it was a difficult fire. It's, it's hard to make the decision to pull out of the fire, but um, a lot of good things come out of this. And one important thing that came out was in the beginning, if you listen to the radio traffic, um, when we did our census updates, the residents weren't home, but we were able to use that to make contact with them. But also, we determined that there was a dog in the house. And with our, using that census information, once the responding units got there, it was early enough in the fire where I could have them cut open a door opening in the garage door. They cut an opening in and went in and got the dog out. Um, that was early enough in a fire where we could still do that. But it just goes to show that anybody hasn't sent their information, census information. Is it important to us? Yes. And anything we can get, you know, we, we'd much appreciate it. You know, Chief Calloway's in the audience and he can tell you personally on running a fire scene when you have, you know, eight or nine different jurisdictions as well as you know 80 plus firefighters the difficulty of running a scene and managing the scene and and dealing with a situation like that um i'm happy with the outcome you go by and look at it and see the roof's gone but knowing that we we didn't lose any residents no firefighter injuries and um and we're just looking at property loss you know i'm, I'm really happy with the outcome of the fire um the next, we left the fire watch there all night. Um, they did have to go up in there a few times in the middle of the night where little rekindles were, and they put those out so it didn't uh, start over. The next morning, myself, the two road units, our auxiliary officer, our detective all came in, and we met with the residents there. And because it really wasn't real safe to be in there on the second floor because of the stuff hanging down, but we were able to go in there 
get all their clothes out, get jewelry, all their belongings like that, and um, it worked out really well. Any questions for the chief? And uh, Councilwoman Conway mentioned the bike safety fair, but I didn't yeah. know you want to mention that also. Yeah. The, um, the bike safety fair is coming up. It'll be, I, know, I wrote it down after you guys saw that. June 24th. June 24th at part. 9 a.m. to 12. Um, again, if anybody wants a volunteer, you know, email. I think Peg's our email, Andrea. The mayor, you too? Okay. So if anybody wants to participate and just come even for a half hour, just to, you know, make an appearance, we'd appreciate it. It's always good in the community to show that you're supported by your council members. The, um, we're also working on the ice cream social through the police department. Um, if anybody has ideas, suggestions and stuff, you can send those emails to uh, Officer Mark Raisler um, so we can do some planning and to get some things together. Um, we want to make sure it's successful and if anybody wants to participate and help, again, um, I think, you know, Amy's done a great job with it, but I think this is an opportunity, you know, We'll, you know, we'll be able to maintain it and know what's going on at all times since we're going to be here anyway, and I think it's, you know, a good thing. Chief, just great job. I, I want to congratulate you, and I did it on next door, but just you great, did. great job to everyone. And I remember not too many years ago when I was starting on council and we, there were people in our community who thought we had too many firefighters and there hadn't been a fire in so many years that so I mean I actually heard we haven't had a fire in so many years so why do we even need to be putting our resources into this kind of um, community <laughs> um, so uh, I think that now we we definitely know for sure why um, got me to thinking about how uh, when my kids were little we were told to have a fire safety plan in our house and to rehearse it in our house which my family actually did, um, and it's maybe something that you could put together at the ice cream social to remind people about. Yeah, we could put something that together. Plan. And also um, remind about the census being the way that the dog was rescued, um, because that, I mean, people might not want to fill it out, but they sure do love their pets. Yeah. And everybody was happy about the, get the dog getting out. Okay, yeah, I'll get something out. Nicole is really good about staying on me especially when it comes to fire prevention week and month and uh she's really good about helping us get that kind of stuff out but we will have something in place for the uh, ice cream social as well okay any other questions for the team now we'll move on to the mayor's report i have just a few items first included in your package was uh was resolution 2018-16 dealing with school safety this subject was I, I mean, this whole issue of, of gun violence and so forth has obviously been something we've talked about at a few council meetings. Uh, but Councilwoman Conway, uh, as part of her role with the LSDMC at Pleasant Ridge Montessori, uh, this is something that the Cincinnati School Board is very conscious of. And so uh, Councilwoman Conway wanted wanted to know whether we wanted to do something similar, and I thought it was a great idea. So I put together this uh, resolution related to school safety. We obviously uh, do not have any public schools in the village. We are part of Cincinnati Public Schools. We do have uh, private schools in the village, uh, but school safety is clearly something uh, related to uh, gun violence and so forth. And so I put together this resolution uh, stressing that you know this is something that we need to take action on. This again will be uh, something that we will forward on to our state representatives uh, and uh, congressmen and, and senators, etc. Uh, so this is this is something I think we really must believe in. So I hereby move that we adopt resolution 2018-16. Second. Second. Sorry. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-16 related to school safety. Are there any questions or comments? I'll just add a clarification, sort of a clarification that uh, since I Public Schools has asked the uh, entities within the district to pass a support resolution. So. 
Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution 2018-16. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Be it noted that the resolution passes unanimous. Uh, next, um, the joint economic development um, agreement that, um, that we have with Sycamore Township. As part of that, uh, every couple of years we have to reappoint the members of the board, the current members of the board for the joint economic development zone for Amberley is the village manager, myself, and Councilwoman uh, Conway, and that has worked very well. Uh, the, the, the JEDS has worked very well, both for Amberley Village and for Sycamore Township. The three members from Sycamore Township are the sitting members of the uh, Board of Trustees for the uh, Sycamore Township. So I hereby move that we nominate to the Board of uh, Village Manager Scott Armour, uh, Councilwoman Peg Conway, and myself. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded that we appoint to the JED Board from Amberley Village, Village Manager Scott Armour, uh, Councilwoman Peg Conway, and Mayor Tom Newman. Uh, it's been moved and seconded, so all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Be it noted that the motion passed unanimous. And then finally, uh, the related to the Environmental Stewardship Committee, it met on uh, May 21st last. Its next meeting will be July 23rd uh, at 7 o'clock in the community room. And finally, related to the Environmental Stewardship Committee, their next Clean the Green uh, where the where volunteers help to do some minor tree maintenance uh, at the green will be uh, June 21st, which is next Thursday, and that that takes place at I believe 5:30. We move forward to five, and, uh, and that concludes my mayor's report. Are there any questions? This is only indirectly related to the manager or the mayor's report. The trees that were removed at the like the entrance to the pathways at Amberley Green, I was startled by that. Were they diseased or something? Or yeah, those, the, those were uh, river birch trees. There were those those trees were most of them were dead. Okay. And there was a uh, recurring theme of those pieces of those trees falling. Oh. And and I was I talked to Tony Ches Chesney about uh, taking those down because I was concerned because that is an area where gardeners walk by. There's a lot of foot trap, yes, definitely a lot of foot trap. And I just thought it made sense to get those down. Any new business? Seeing none, we can consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you.